So starting out, would you guys, anybody have any thoughts? If you do have thoughts, just try to direct yourself, direct your voice to a microphone if you can. Anybody have any thoughts about this morning? Hmm, are you all in? It's another great question. This is the way Jesus communicates, isn't it? This is, these are the things that he's saying. I feel like I'm a little bit hot here. But, um, anybody else? No? Well, we're going to read, picking up in verse 32. Um, Lord willing, I, I don't see any reason why we won't be able to get right through to the end of this chapter. I'm going to read it. So open up the word of God. Sorry. Sorry. Is that too close, you think? Should I turn it the other way? Is that better? Yep. We're trying. We're trying. Okay, open up the Word of God, Gospel of John, chapter 7, beginning in verse 32. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to seize him. Therefore, Jesus said, for a little while longer I am with you, Then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews then said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? He's not intending to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? What is this statement that he said? You will seek me. You will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Some of the people, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, This certainly is the prophet. Others were saying, This is the Christ. Still others were saying, Surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the descendants of David, from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So a division occurred in the crowd because of him. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers came to the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they said to him, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, Never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. The Pharisees then answered them, Have you not also been led astray? You have not also been led astray, have you? No one, of the re- no one of the rulers or Pharisees has believed him, has he? But this crowd, which does not know the law, is accursed. Nicodemus, he who came to him before, being one of them, said to them, Our law does not judge a man unless it, is, unless it first hears from him and knows what he's doing, does it? They answered him, You're not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. Let's pray. Lord, we, we come acknowledging that you know who are yours and asking that you would speak to everyone here. Guide our words, guide our thoughts, Open up this book of life to us. In your name I pray, amen. So, we could, um, there's literally five different directions we could go. And I don't know what one we're going to go. So, is there anything that automatically jumps out at anybody from this passage as we read through it? 
it seems nothing has changed. Did it, nothing has changed. Well, what, with the what do you mean? The concept of who Jesus is, we still have a mixed bag in this country about who he is and, and so on and so forth. And it looks to me like on the morality side, there are more thinking that he isn't much hmm. compared to really who he is. Anybody else have any thoughts? I think that's absolutely true. Not much has changed. I had a Jehovah's Witness come to our door yesterday, and I, I talked with him. I usually do, and I asked him questions about what do you believe about Jesus, and I raised a number of issues. Who is Jesus? Do you believe in him as Savior? Did he come to save the world? And they kept saying, yes, 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 yes. I said, in other words, you and I believe the same. Well, yes. Then they said, what, what is the kingdom? What do you believe is the kingdom? Well, I think that's where we go down different roads. And I think the issue is, that we find in this passage, is Jesus is very well defined. And you either believe big B, or you're playing with the little b. Okay. So, context again. The festival of tabernacles, or the festival of booths, and Bob jumped into that a little bit. Um, this is, you know, it's not a, it's not a chronological gospel, but this is most likely the next festival, the next big gathering since the last time Jesus was at a festival. And he offended, the, he offended the leaders. We've already, we've already looked at and seen they're coming to kill him. They know he has to die. All right? Um, the festival of booths is eight days long. And it is a party. And I think that what Bob alluded to today is where the, the people went automatically. And that's it, it, it should be a celebration any time. Any time those of us partake in this glorious gospel, is it not celebratory? Isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it breaks our heart sometimes. But it always, it always goes to worship, ultimately. Does it not? The Festival of Booths is really two things. It's both memorial and prophetic. We could look at different places in the Bible where it talks about it. It's memorial because it's a time of remembering the Exodus. When people were in bondage and they're on their way to the promise. Okay? Now, from the very beginning, because it's too hard in this passage to wait until like a nice little tidy package at the end, like I said, a bunch of different directions we could go. The same is true for us. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not where you were. And you're not where you're going. This is a time of remembrance. It's a memorial festival. We could look at Leviticus, and we probably will later, but it says on the first day, it's a holy convocation. It's not just a party. It was a party. But the first day was a holy convocation, and the last day was a holy convocation. It was, a, it was a time to look back and recall, again, the faithfulness and the provision of God. We see that the crowd is still talking about what happened at the last festival, right? Bob talked about that. The circumcision, he, where, he, where he started talking about circumcision on the eighth day, I healed the whole man, what's your, what's your deal? They want, they want him to die. We see that the Pharisees are out to get him. They're looking for way. They're looking for an opportunity to seize him. They were looking for him, didn't see him, because they were looking where the you know the festival of booths is. A, they would take these branches and they would make these shelters and they would go live in these shelters for eight days. And yes, it was a, a it was a time of celebration and festival, party. And Jesus is in the temple. Um. I want to just concentrate. We could, <clears throat> let's just do it right now. We, we could look at, at some of the things that were said about Jesus at the end. 
And I don't even know if we need to go there. I mean, because like Harold said, people are still thinking wrong thoughts about Jesus. You and I are still thinking wrong thoughts about Jesus. We are. Unless we know him perfectly, so I don't even know, we don't even have to go there. So there's one of those five gone. Thank you, Lord. Okay, let's look at verse 33. Therefore, Jesus said, For a little while longer I'm with you. Then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me. You will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. You know, kind of easy to run right through that, run right past it. What's he saying here? What is he saying? How long is he with them? Look at your Bible, verse 33. How long is Jesus with them? Short time. A short time. A short time. Not a long time. How long is he with us? How long is the invitation to us? We, we have no guarantee. We have no guarantee. If we're playing around with, with church, there's no guarantee that we have another opportunity later today. Is there? Do we have a guarantee that there will be a, the opportunity for me to have the presto change of deathbed conversion after I live my life on my terms? Did you guys hear the message Pastor Bob just preached? Okay, there's no guarantee. Short time. Short time. Short time. We know, that, we know that primarily what's being discussed here is towards the Jews at this festival, at this time, you know, during his ministry. But there is secondary truth, secondary application here that applies to us. Some of us are Pharisees. Some of us are plain. What happens when, he, when he's no longer there? Look at verse 33. What, what happens? For a little while he's with them. For a little while he's with us. And then what happens? He goes to, the, he goes to where he came from, doesn't he? So he, for a while he's here, and then he's gone. And yep. we to interpret that that the convicting of the Holy Spirit is only going to be with us for a short time? I think that's absolutely... I think... I don't, I don't... I won't call that a rule, Harold, because I believe that the Lord is gracious enough to, to beckon to one from the time they're old enough to understand until the moment they die, and maybe that one never receives. Maybe that one never yields. But I certainly would not form a doctrine on it. I certainly would not stand on some principled notion that God owes me the right to repent after I'm done having my fun. Okay? I'm going to get a little riled a little bit, I think. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't, I'm going to be weeping. But doesn't the scripture say that if you continue to reject the Holy Spirit, that he will withdraw? Absolutely. Harden your heart. Harden your heart. Quench the spirit. Yes, sir. Take heed lest you fall. I mean, we could look at, I mean, I'm t I'm, that, is, that is constant in Scripture. Sorry, Chad. That is constant in Scripture. Verse 34, what does he say? At some point in time, what are they going to do? They're going to look for him. Actually, seek has got a pretty earnest sense about it if you if you think about it they're going to seek for him 
And the result? Uh uh. This passage right here, I mean, th those two verses, the first several times I read through this in preparation, I just went right over it. We go right over it. If you're anything like me, the temptation is to check the check the chore off the box. You know, I got done doing the daily devotion, or I read through my passage I have to get through for my go through the Bible in a year, or <laughs> if, you, if you take some time, it's amazing. If, if you take some time to mine it, it's amazing the treasure that's there. There is both glorious light and frightening darkness in this passage. <laughs> These couple verses, is there not? Do you believe Jesus? I believe Jesus. This is all, I'll be right with you, this is all flowing out of the message that we, I mean, the, the context, the message that we just heard this morning. It all matters on what you do with Jesus, what you think about Jesus. Whether you believe Jesus, whether you are willing to take these words as truth, apply, adhere to. Yes? Oh, it just came to my mind. I just saw a picture of a real lark and one God code to go up. That's right. And, you know, you can only imagine when the rain was coming and they realized that what um, Noah had said was going to happen, that God and they didn't, they were only seeking to, to get into the ark. It's almost like that, the way you're emphasizing, that's what the picture that came to my head, yeah. was that there's a point where it should stop. You know, we had, uh, I think you're exactly right, we, we, my wife and I were able to get out of town on Friday night, we got to watch Madeline perform the best concert I've ever seen her, I mean, it was just incredible. It was on, it was this performance based on Dante's Inferno. Don't know if you guys know anything about Dante's Inferno. Um, but it's this picture of a person gets lost. The storyteller brings him along through purgatory and Dante's hell, version of hell. And then ultimately at the very end, there's this opportunity to get a picture of the face of God. So it was a wonderful, it was just a wonderful, you know, those of us that know something about the Lord, we see him all over the place. And so that was fun. And yesterday we got to watch, we walked through, we got to spend some time with some great people we love, and we got to look at the Minnesota uh, Institute of Art. And it was just amazing, the, the creativity. And, and he was screaming at me. All day long, but the thing what I thought the thought the thing I thought was the most interesting. We also went to St. Paul's Cathedral. I've been there before. Highly recommend. Highly recommend you go. Highly, highly recommend you go. I appreciate it from an architectural standpoint, from a craftsman standpoint. But boy, it is so good to sit in the halls of something that tens of thousands of man hours and dollars went towards in their attempt to reach God. You want to be humbled by the goodness that the gospel just fell in your lap? Think about it. Go sit in a place like that. We got to sit there. And while we're sitting there, um, before when I'd been there, there, not, there wasn't people, but for whatever reason, we were there during a busy time. There were these groups of people that were going around, and, and they were, they were, there were people that were leading these prayers and these incantations and these chants. My heart broke. The attempt, the striving, the working out the earnest desire to get to a place where they could be accepted. And it sounded like this vast room of it was it was it was 
man, I'm telling you, the gospel is clear. It's simple. And it's done. But someday, it's not going to be offered anymore to each and every one of us as individuals. There is a start and a stop. It's not a guarantee. Anybody else want to jump in on a comment real quick? The Jews, of course, are confused. They're darkened in their mind. They, they have no clue what's being said. What's he going to go off into the Gentile world? Try to convert some of them? It's, right? They missed it. I get it. I missed it much of my life, too. The, the interesting thing about the Jews is they don't know how to handle this. And so at the very end, you look at the oppressive... This is kind of what made me think about this yesterday and, and preparing for this, but you look at the oppressive nature of organized religion. What do, the, what do the Jews, what do the Pharisees say at the end? They're even bullying the officers. Oh, you be, what do you now believe? You can just see the bully in the hallway putting the finger in the chest of one that is searching and doesn't quite know what to do. Nobody's talked like this before. This is unique. You better be careful. What is this statement that he said, you will seek me and will not find me? Does that drip with pride? Does it? I hear pride. How dare he? We know the way. This is really where one could spend a lot of time on these next couple of verses. 37. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Now, I've been enjoying as of late looking at root words. First of all, I can go, I'll just go quickly to Leviticus. Leviticus 23, verse 26 and thereabouts talks about this festival. The Lord spoke to Moses. I'm starting in uh, Leviticus 23, verse 33. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month is the Feast of Booths. Four seven days to the Lord. So the festival is a specified time, and who's it for? For the Lord. What we do is for the Lord even our parties. On the first day of Holy Convocation, you shall do no laborious work of any kind. For seven days you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a Holy Convocation and present an offering by fire to the Lord. It's really kind of interesting. You can go down and finish the passage if you wanted to think on this a little bit more. But it's for God. God set it up. That's what God wants. We saw in Bob's passage this morning that at the, very, at the beginning, he was quiet. But mid midway through this eight-day festival, Jesus speaks up. Right? Now we're on the last day. <coughs> so that's probably for sure four days. Maybe it's five. It's hard to say. But he's speaking up. What is he saying? How is he saying it's more important? He stood up. And then what did he do? He cried out. Interesting. If you dig in and cry out, that is the that, that word is the exact same word that describes the scream of a raven in the Greek. We live in rural area. Who here knows what a raven sounds like? We know what ravens sound like. Same word. Describes both. 
There is a croaking. There is an earnest appeal that attention would be given. Earlier, his time had not yet come. And I think the time that not yet come is talking about that glorification that ultimately culminates in the, the resurrection. His time has not yet come either. Although you see the stages, you know, the, the stakes are getting higher and higher all the time. On the last day of this fantastic festival, in the midst of this holy convocation, Jesus stands up. Jesus can yell, I can too. What does he say? What does he say? Does anyone thirst? Who here has been thirsty? Okay. Who here has really been thirsty? <laughs> okay. How long <clears throat> was it that you went without liquor? Anybody have a story? Was it an hour in the hot sun? Was it an afternoon fixing a fence? Was it, what was it? Tell me what it felt like. Anybody? Crowd participation time. What does it feel like to be thirsty? Well, anybody? All right. I hitchhiked my way through the outback of Australia. I wouldn't do it again. <laughs> I didn't realize it at the time, but I left with enough water to get me through not quite lunch. <laughs> that's me. There, that's, that's, that, that's me right there. I'll tell you what my thirst felt like. It started with discomfort. It moved into just really sticky mouth. It evolved further into cracked lips, and it got to the point where my tongue felt like a solid piece of wood. That's my knowledge of thirst. So, what's Jesus saying? <laughs> Is he talking physically? No. But I want, I want to ask the question, who here, who here has been so uncomfortable <clears throat> or dry, so dissatisfied with some part of their life? Anybody? You don't have to raise your hand. This is not crowd participation time, unless you feel like you want to. Who here has yearned who here? Another way to ask the same question. What have you thirsted for? Let's work on that a minute. What are you thirsty for? What are we thirsty for today? Well, for a new convert, for someone who accepts Christ for the very first time, you don't know what you're thirsting for but the Holy Spirit convicts you and proves that, and after that time, you learn what you were missing. I think there's truth in that statement. I, in my own life, I didn't know what I was going after. I didn't know what I was desperately longing for, but I, I so I tried just about everything. Just about everything. So for me, my thirst was like self-satisfaction. Some people in this room thirst for more power. Some people in this room might be thirsting for a, more of a voice. More uh, doctrine. 
Some people in this room very well may be thirsting for better family life or a promotion at work. I'm asking the question. Jesus, no, I'm not asking. Jesus is asking the question, are you thirsty? Everybody's thirsty. What are you thirsty for? This is the, the, the beauty of this is that it, it works from the most aged to the most youngest of children. What do you want? What do you want? Jump in, Jimmy. They were absolutely satisfied. We've had our holidays, and we're full. And we've been satisfied with life. Everything is hunky dory. And the deeper <coughs> the question that I think is offensive in, in a way, because it challenges that lack of satisfaction. I think maybe for an application for us, the holidays are coming up. You know, are we completely satisfied in our life? Is everything hunky dory? Or is there That's the question that Jesus is asking. And just like before, that is the question that he repeatedly asks. It is not a one and done question. What I'm thirsty for as a 20-year-old man, or say an 18-year-old man walking through the outback of Australia was entirely different than what I was thirsty for as a 35-year-old man the eve before my conversion. And the next day, my thirst changed again. And the question needs to be asked over and over again. What is it that you long for? What is it that you desire? Yes? I think there's a two-issue thing on the table here. One is, what do we seek? <coughs> Who do we seek? I think we often come to God saying, I want this, or I'd like this, or this would be good, add this to my life, or whatever. That's the what part of it. But I think we, in the process, miss seeking Jesus or God personally. And I think that's where we should start. And I'm not very good at that. That's what, he, that's what he's saying. But I, I'm, it's I'm pretty good at the other part, asking or seeking what, but not so much who. Because the what, at least in my life, the what can be filled in by me. I can't, the who can't be. But God can give the what in proper balance or proper perspective. If and only if it begins with everlasting life, living water. Um, yes, exactly. So, as I'm looking at this this week, what I'm seeing, what I'm seeing is, you, you think, creator of the universe, we already saw that, right? We, we, we went through that in, in the first chapter of John. We saw who he is, who he, who he is, that took on flesh. That's <laughs> we see, we see him, we see him all knowing, we see him all powerful. We see he has dominion over disease. We see he has dominion over the elements. We see that he understands what people are thinking. Right? And here he stands up, and it's almost like he's croaking out this appeal. Listen. Listen. Who can be thirsty? The woman at the well was thirsty. So was the crippled man. A thief and one in authority, both are thirsty. So was the person that grew up in the church. 
So is the person that had the worst childhood existence you could possibly imagine. They're both thirsty. The thirst is there. It is a part of it, of us. We have, I, I dare say, this earnest, zealous, nearly, nearly pitiful cry. Come to me. Get to know the who. Too many people are thirsty for attention, their avarice, their advantage, you know, the, the way that they kind of orchestrated their little life. Bob spoke to all that. Too many people are thirsty for their own indulgence. That was, that was me. I was thirsty for my own indulgence. What, what do I want right now? Sometimes I wanted to be left alone, and sometimes I wanted a group of adoring friends happy to see me walk into the room. That's what I wanted. I thirsted for self-indulgence. But I think what's really interesting is, look what happens. Who can, who can drink? What's required? We should even go back before. For you to be satisfied, what do you need to do? Come. And? Believe. What? Believe. Not quite, not yet. Drink. Drink. It's literally that simple. Why would Jesus, why would Jesus tell somebody that's thirsty, drink? Isn't that interesting? But in defense of them, who were listening, who were true believers, they had no idea what living water meant because the Holy Spirit hadn't been given. So unless they were convicted by God, they wouldn't understand at that point what he was saying. And mystery of mysteries, Harold, that is no defense. I'm sorry? And mystery of mysteries, that is no defense. I, I think that, that we, can, we can wrestle through that, but the reality is their understanding was not part of the deal. The invitation was there, come and drink. Clearly, he's calling to somebody. He's calling to, he's calling to a, a group. And there will be, like Bob said, there will be a few that come. But he knew. Of course he knew. Of course he knew. But he was telling, he was saying the same message to However many people wouldn't come, however many people wouldn't drink, the fact that they didn't understand that that's what he was saying doesn't let him off the hook. That's all I'm, that's all I'm, we're splitting hairs a little bit, but James. I would suggest that, you know, you talked about a lot of different thirsts for different things. I would suggest that there's only one thirst for God. And if everyone wanted to accept that as the answer to it, their need, that's what drives all the, the, the attempts to indulge in, in, in food and in, in striving for <coughs> fame, for, for all those other things, is an attempt to fill empty lives that can really only be filled by, by God. I think, that, I think that, that that's true. I think the way that I would say that would be there's only one thirst that satisfies. That satisfaction is found in Jesus Christ, God, man. Jim? I think I'd add to that. There's, and I see it every day. There is a secular search for truth, and there's a spiritual search for truth. Yeah. We dance around what is true or what is fact or what's reality or whatever. We play with that every day at coffee in some shape or form. But I think that says something about the human heart. Deep down inside, we want to know what the final real issue is. It's, I think St. Augustine <coughs> said, there's a hole in our hearts. There's a desire to fill an emptiness. Only God can do it, but how do we get there? Everybody has got that 
built into him or her because God designed us with a spiritual nature. And, and he, he designed us to bear his image. And there's a myriad of ways, even though you were designed to be that, there's a myriad of different ways that you can miss the mark and not actually, and, and, and the end result is not self-satisfaction. Not, I shouldn't say self-satisfaction. Not <coughs> satisfaction. We were created to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength to worship him and to bear his image to those around us. We even see that right here. What's the result of the one that believes? What flows out of them? Rivers of living water. And you think about the picture of that. We, we talk, like, fill me with your spirit. I'd say that. Fill me with your spirit. And I think maybe better would be, flow through me and out of me your spirit. Because really what I'm doing is I'm getting farther away from, hey, be available for what I need you for to do whatever it is that you desire of me for the sake of you as I do whatever it is that you're requiring of me towards somebody else. Are there people that are thirsty in your life? Maybe you're thirsty. Maybe you're not thirsty. But even if you're not thirsty, are there people around you that are thirsty? There are. There are. We can be living water to them. We will. It's, it, it doesn't say we can. We will be. He who believes, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow. Not might flow. It will. So we can, we can ask ourselves, what happens there? Is that, is that going on in my life? Is, is the water of life flowing out of me? Satisfying thirsty people around me. The Lord has been patiently pleading with them, and the Lord, I think, in a lot of ways is patiently pleading with us. He's doing it right now with us, waiting to lavish upon us the full measure of his grace. Even though, quite possibly, some of us, and for sure, in our community, there are many that are standing only because they still exist under his protective mercy. Not because they're partakers of his grace because he's merciful. I love this picture because in this picture of Jesus we see one that is boisterous yet tender. We see one that is bold yet meek. This is who we come to. This is who we have to deal with. It doesn't matter what we thought. It matters what we think. He offers complete soul satisfaction. The last thing I want to just remind us is that, you know, when I was walking through the, the, the desert in Australia and I got my hands on the water and my thirst was quenched, you know what happened the next day? Thirsty again. I was thirsty again. <laughs> and, and I think that's a really important thing to be reminded of is that, you know, if you've, if you've 